For almost 3,000 years, both prominent as well as simple Jewish people of faith have requested that they be laid to rest here on the slopes of the Mount of Olives, which overlooks the city of King David to the west, while looking upwards towards the area believed by many to be the site of both the first and second Jewish temples. Currently, however, there is to be found no Jewish temple either on this proposed platform, known by both Jews and Christians as the Temple Mount, nor on any other proposed location within the boundaries of Israel. Instead, atop this dominating platform cherished by all three of the world's monotheistic religions, sits Kobet el Sahra, or better known to me and you as the Dome of the Rock an Islamic shrine marking the spot where, it is claimed, Muhammad ascended to heaven on a mythical heavenly beast named Burakh. Thus this shrine of remembrance is now considered Islam's third most holy site. In contrast to this, most Jews understand this site to be the location where God's presence resided on earth within the inner sanctum of his temple, the Holy of Holies, and where it is understood that Messiah will enter when he comes to deliver God's people. For Christians, this is the place where Messiah already came and entered God's temple and drove out all of the moneylenders who had corrupted his father's house, turning the house of prayer into a den of thieves. At which point thereafter, Yeshua, Jesus, purposed himself to do his Father's will, become the sacrificial Lamb of God, and offer himself up for the sins not only of his own people, the Jews, but for the whole world. Only to be raised again on the third day, in accordance with Scripture, so to bring in God's everlasting righteousness towards all who might believe on the name of Yeshua, Jesus, as God's scapegoat and saviour on behalf of all mankind. And so it was to be, from this poignant landmark in Israel's religious history, there arose a bitter and ever-widening division between the Jewish peoples that has lasted to this day. Those Jews who believed on the risen Yeshua as Messiah claiming he did indeed satisfy all the requirements of the ancient scriptures and more, and those Jews who rejected such, rather continuing to trust fervently on the righteous requirements of the law of Moses and on their own justification through observances and good works before God. Then something unexpected happened. Unexpected on one hand, yet prophesied by Yeshua, Jesus before his death, resurrection and ascension. Both Jesus and his disciples had been walking in Jerusalem before the Passover when some of his disciples had begun to boast regarding the great stones of the temple structure. Hearing this, Jesus turned to them and made the most amazing prophecy regarding the temple and declared, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly I say to you, not one stone should be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Sure enough, in AD 70, the Roman Empire, led by Titus, sacked Jerusalem and utterly destroyed the second Jewish temple, uprooting every single stone from its foundation to retrieve the melted gold which ran between them, fulfilling Jesus' prophecy to the letter and leaving Jerusalem completely devastated and its people dispersed among the nations for almost 2,000 years. Yet arguably even more shocking than Jesus' prophetic accuracy regarding the destruction of Jerusalem and her temple must be the prophetic writings and accuracy of the Old Testament prophet Daniel, 
written down almost 600 years prior to Jesus' coming, who being in exile in Babylon, after Nebuchadnezzar's armies had laid Jerusalem and her temple to waste the first time due to the nation's apostasy and sin against the Lord, found Daniel here repenting before the Lord for the sins of his people and inquiring as to when it might be that they could return back home to Jerusalem to restore the city and rebuild the temple. In answered prayer, Daniel was given not only the response he so longed to hear, but also was given the whole dispensation of future events regarding his people and the holy city. Within this prophetic discourse between himself and the angel Gabriel, Daniel was given the exact time when the Messiah would finally come, that when he did come, Messiah would be cut off, that his life would be cut short, yet not for himself, but sacrificially for the sake of all others. The text then goes on to describe in detail the events following Messiah's visitation to his people, and how, because of the nation's failure to neither recognize nor accept their saviour, the city was to fall again and the temple and sacrifices ended, exactly how Messiah had also prophesied. Forty years Israel as a nation were given to repent. But repent from what? Now as he, Jesus, drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes, for the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. That time of visitation had indeed been given and forewarned, and clearly none of the religious leaders responsible for being a light and guide unto their people had fully seen nor understood it, or they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. The question that remains, therefore, must be, how was it missed? A conundrum important for us to grasp if we are to safeguard ourselves from making the same or similar mistakes as they. For one thing is certain, the very generation we are now entering into, all scripture agrees and defines plainly as being the single most godless and dangerous age of deceit to have been birthed into, an age and generation in which, if it were possible, could even deceive the very elect themselves. Therefore, if we are not to fall foul of like failures, we'd be wise to take time out, in which to try to understand these things and take heed of the lessons which can be learned. This being the very purpose and reason for this documentary, in an attempt to help safeguard us from falling foul of the lies and deceit which is about to, and already is, overshadowing truth in our world today. A great set of lies prophesied to come, seen and agreed on throughout all the patriarchs, prophets, kings, apostles, and of course by the Lord himself. A time like no other, designed and orchestrated with one purpose, to blind us all from knowing and seeing our Lord during this encroaching darkness. In such times of utter darkness, God will always hold up a light for true hearts to both see and follow, and will not leave this world without a witness. Through the illumination of God's holy word, it is our belief that we are already engulfed in that darkness and are heading further down deeper into it. The darkness which was prophesied by the prophets and by our Lord himself. As such, it is our desire to not only expose some of those deceiving spirits which have entered into our world and indeed into our church, 
but also, and perhaps more importantly, to focus our attention on that promised great light which is to come before the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. A great light which comes in the form of a witness. But a witness to what? A witness to the Gospel? A witness to Christ? A witness to Torah? Or somehow all of the above? Or is it something more personal than that? We believe so. But nevertheless, it is a requirement within God's Torah, within the law, that there be at least two witnesses to establish the truth in any matter, especially a conviction which may lead to the death penalty, which is why the conviction of our Lord to the cross, to crucifixion, was by very definition of the law illegal and improper. The gathered witnesses at his trial could not collaborate their stories. Pontius Pilate himself declared that he found nothing in this man that was deserving of death and found no guilt in him. And even Herod sent Jesus back to Pontius Pilate finding no wrong in him at all. Yet what we are about to discover is that God himself has provided the required witnesses Two witnesses which go above and beyond our expectations to bring to us the most staggering revelation and most glorious fulfillment of this legal requirement. Very possibly an even greater witness than the church and even the apostles themselves. Sounds almost blasphemous? It won't. Yet first, let us together take a few moments just to see a few of these examples of the requiring of two witnesses within the law. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit. Deuteronomy 17 and 6 Whoever is deserving of death shall be put to death on the testimony of two or three witnesses. He shall not be put to death on the testimony of one witness. Here we see the establishing of this biblical construct within God's law. Again in Deuteronomy 19 verse 15. One witness shall not rise against a man concerning any iniquity or any sin that he commits. By the mouth of two or three witnesses the matter shall be established. And again in the New Testament with the words of our Lord in Matthew 18 verses 16 through 17. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established and faithfully repeated by the Apostle Paul here also in 2 Corinthians 13 verse 1 This will be the third time I am coming to you by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word will be established It is therefore safe to conclude without any doubt that the biblical principle of the need for two witnesses before establishing any kind of conviction is absolutely set in stone. I'd like to offer just one more example which will take us back to the Old Testament which is found in Zechariah chapter 4 verse 11 through 14. Then I answered and said to him, What are these two olive trees at the right of the lampstand and at its left? And I further answered and said to him, what are these two olive branches that drip into the receptacles of the two gold pipes from which the golden oil drains? Then he answered me and said, Do you not know what these are? And I said to him, No, my lord. So he said, These are the two anointed ones who stand beside the Lord of the whole earth. We believe that this scripture in particular is extremely important and directly references the two witnesses which we see in the book of Revelation and for which we will get back to a little later.
At this point, let's take a look at where these two witnesses make their entrance into the book of the Revelation. And having done so, make note of some of the deliberate descriptive details given us of these two individuals. Then I was given a reed, like a measuring rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise, measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there, but leave out the court, which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot for forty-two months. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy one thousand two hundred and sixty days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These have the power to shut up heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. And they have powers over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. When they finish their testimony, the beast that sends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Then those from the peoples, tribes, tongues and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry and send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Now after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them and they stood on their feet. And great fear fell on those who saw them. And they heard a voice from heaven saying to them, Come, Come up, up here. here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. In the same hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. In the earthquake seven thousand people were killed, and the rest were afraid, and gave glory to the God of heaven. Please understand here what we have just read and what it means for us as believers. That our Lord Jesus wants those who are his to recognize not only who these two identities are, but also understand the glory of what these two men are witnessing too. As one thing is certain, when these two witnesses appear, they do so firstly to condemn a world who, by now have utterly rejected Jesus as God's Son and denied any notion that he was slain for the sins of mankind. And instead, we see a world against Jesus Christ and against the ordinances of God. Or should we just stick to the Sermon on the Mount, a passage that is so radical that it's doubtful that our own Defense Department would survive its application. We, Jesus said, for God so loved the world that he gave his own. Doesn't disturb us now. You sir. are not welcome, okay? I'm going to give you a dispersal notice to leave the area. I'm not going to leave the okay? area, sir. If you fail to do so, you will be arrested. Get up! Get up! I've got a bad back, sir! Well, get up! Get up! You're hurting my arm! Dude, why are you hurting my arm? Like you spreading the good word on the job has an Indiana State trooper out of work tonight. Yeah. Former ISP trooper Brian Hamilton is a popular man in Connorsville, where he's often found preaching out in public. Everybody has a right to uh, to talk to people. He, was, he, he did not try to force himself on anyone. He asked a question. A question that ultimately got him fired. State police announced Hamilton's termination on Thursday in the wake of a second complaint. He was offering prayer while in state police uniform. I wish other officers would do that. Maybe it might touch my kid's heart that they'll get in church and give their heart to God.
sir. You gotta repent, sir. You gotta repent, sir, for murdering babies. Why? Because it's a sin before God. Why? Well, stinky breath. Yeah, Why? that's pretty. That's pretty evil of you, sir. Yeah, I am. And I hope and pray that you. Well, that's what you do to babies, huh? Yeah, I love it. You love it, huh? Yeah, I do. Okay, I hope that you come to Christ, sir. Oh, I never go to Christ. I hope that you come to Christ. No, sir. I don't go to Christ. Yeah, you. I don't you, listen to Christ. You, you will have a darkened heart, sir. I do have a darkened yes. heart. Yeah. You have a darkened heart. I do. I do very, very much. And so. you will stand yeah. before God in judgment. Yes, day, I will. Day. Every day. You will stand before God in judgment. Yes, day. I will. Every day. All of the babies that I you love have. It. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Yeah, keep tearing the babies. Yeah, apart. I will. Keep tearing the babies. I apart. will. Beating his head, and he ain't going anywhere. We have your children. We have everyone that we need to defeat you. Because in the last war, there was one third, and we almost won. Michael Anu, I don't care what you go by now, we will defeat you. Hundreds of people turned out tonight for the unveiling of a very controversial statue. Yeah, it really is. The Satanic Temple of Detroit revealed the one-ton bronze statue. As a small group of protesters prayed, hundreds waited for tickets to the unveiling of an eight-foot-tall bronze statue of a goat-headed Satan. Most of the people here agree with the teachings of the Satanic Temple, the group responsible for the event. It's here, it's in Detroit, and this is fantastic that like we get to experience this and we get to see this amazing statue be unveiled for all the world to see. I'm just excited to see my Lord and Savior Baphomet represented in such glorious Italian stone. of our nature as written in the annals of history, a gift from Lucifer, the light bringer, the morning star, and the rebel. We are Satanists. We engender moral, spiritual, and sexual freedom, personal independence, and insist upon personal choice in all things. Satanism is a philosophy of action. In those who desire and act not breed pestilence. We do not seek followers. We are seeking collaborators. Individuals for a visionary satanic alliance. Leaders of the new American era. Let us rise up in celebration of our satanic nature and cast our chains into the dust of hell. All hail the new American era. All hail the eternal rebel within all of us, to liberty, humanity, and justice, to the satanic emancipator and end of repressive traditions. Hail Satan! Then, as if this were not enough, we have the dark art of spirit cooking with its main instigator, Marina Abramovic. Alistair Crowley, the Satanist, formulated spirit cooking as a part of his Black Mass Sacrament. His ritual is closely linked to, and inclusive of, child sacrifice and cannibalism. No surprise at all, then, that here we see Abramovic creating an effigy of a small child and covering it in blood. Her so-called art drawing together the satanic, rich and famous, who willingly accept her invitation to take part in her mock cannibalistic dinner parties. Little wonder then that we see her guests emulating both Crowley's and Abramovic in similar style satanic ritual. Let's take a look. Marina, I think you are so wonderful, so beautiful and inspiring and... 
wants to translate what her work means into my own life. I am obsessed with this woman. She is so incredible. Musicians, actors, businessmen, politicians, and those of the global elite aristocracy around the world have likewise and quite literally sworn to Lucifer, just as Lady Gaga has. There is available to us more than sufficient evidence which illuminates the truth that not only are our world's elites worshipping Lucifer in the shadows, but also that these Luciferians operate covertly within the dark corridors of power, communicating deep down hidden in the dark web, in secret board meetings, and within the darkened chambers of secret societies. Claims such as these seem extreme or outlandish to many. Oh, come on! Come on! Come on! Oh, come on! Come on! Oh, come on! Oh, come on! Oh, come on! Oh, come on. Think. And indeed, those who wish to remain clandestine not only proliferate such notions as absurdity, but also disseminate disinformation and bury the truth of it under a slag heap of fantastical, otherworldly, often fictitious conspiracy theories. And even if truth seems to want to insist on rising to the surface, They quickly label it as fake news instead, through their control of media. In fact, they have become so skilled at this art of deception and cover-up, that they have created a condition in the minds of the masses, which believes that the word conspiracy itself is somehow synonymous with being crazy or paranoid. And if by chance you claim a conspiracy, you usually get accused of being one of those conspiracy nuts. The great Oz has spoken. Oh, pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. The great Oz has spoken. Who are you? Oh, I, I, I am the great and powerful Wizard of Oz. Yet history has proven again and again in every age that the undoing of a civilization was always brought about by those who secretly plotted against it and they achieve their goals because of the complacency of the naive. Or as Edmund Burke famously put it, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. The acceptance and understanding that there are indeed clandestine forces at work in the shadows, plotting to bring down the status quo for their own ends, is not merely the arena of the paranoid, but is something that every king Prime Minister or President knows is both his and his subject's greatest enemy and potential Trojan horse to watch out for. President Kennedy, who was more than likely assassinated by the very elites we refer to, puts it well. The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically, opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. 
For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. I am not asking your newspapers to support an administration, but I am asking your help in the tremendous task of informing and alerting the American people. This is but the tip of an iceberg, which plunges the icy depths of mankind's departure from God and the hope which is in Jesus, the Messiah or Christ. An age of do as thou wilt or do what feels good instead of God's will be done. An era in which the making of money is the only justifier to whether or not something is right or should be done at all. A time when the creation of evil things is justified only by their necessity over our enemies and the seeking of pleasure has replaced holiness toward God. Indeed, as a world, we are quickly replacing God with our idols of pleasure and becoming incapable of putting them down or switching them off. In fact, it seems we are insistent on taking our idols of pleasure to a whole new level. <laughs> From delivery drones to automated cars, now there's robots you can have sex with. Artificial intelligence is making its way into the global sex market. While some say the sex robots are the next step in evolution, many experts fear that the lack of guidelines and regulations can lead to some alarming consequences. What's the ethical and moral and legal questions involved, especially with those, those, those robots that are made to look like children? Number one, you know somebody is going to want to buy, and please forgive me, but we're adults. Somebody is going to want to buy either an infant, a child, or an animal, or a barnyard critter, or something sure. with the express purpose of being intimate with that robot. Now, you know and I know somebody's going to say, you can't do that. Why? Well, because that's illegal. No, it's not. And what we're going to be getting into is a thought crime. There is little denying that, as a world, we have become obsessed with pleasures, entertainments, and of self, and the selfie, and instead of drawing our affirmation from a God who did not even spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, we prefer, rather, to draw our worth from the well of worldly popularity and achievement. This is Oscar. <laughs> Oh, it's Oscar. Especially that of social media, often only ever feeling good about ourselves if and when we get the next like or a thumbs up from our virtual friends online, scoring our temporary fix of dopamine in our attempt to feel some kind of life and value. We are part of a world desperately hiding from our own emptiness. We claim to be more connected than ever before. And in a communication sense, indeed, we are. Yet today, as a social, caring community, and even family unit, we have never been less connected and dysfunctional. Just as the prophecy regarding the last days rightly foretold, knowledge shall increase, many will run to and fro, and the love of many will run cold. Our hearts can only ever be filled by the grace and worth which comes from God in Christ Jesus. It is this hopelessness which Lucifer 
and his agents not only take advantage of, but work tirelessly to nurture, creating chaos and mayhem so that in a world gone crazy, you abandon hope in God and look for new answers. Their goal? Hello. To create a world which trusts in itself, independent from God. To be independent, self-assured or self-reliant seems noble on the surface. Yet it shocks many to realize that this is a deep deception, which is, at its core, antichrist in nature. How so? To be self-assured and dependent only on self-reliance rejects the very notion of needing a savior. Yet, if we reject God's only way of salvation, which is in Christ Jesus, and choose rather to trust in self, we will die in our sins. This is the house which was built on sand instead of on the rock of God's salvation. This is also why Satan is increasingly evangelizing this false gospel during these last days, so to rob you of life eternal in Christ. Playing on mankind's pride to ensnare, tickling our pride with self-worth, Self-healing and self-love is his mantra, but it seems so right, so natural, and so moral. For the next 40 days, every morning you are to write 40 statements of I am. I am love. I am beauty. I am peace. I am joy. I am power. I am worth. I am truth. I am light. I am. Not I am loving or I am lovable. I am love. I am power. Every day for 40 days. If you miss a day, go back and do it again. I am. This is error. As the proverb rightly says, there is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. This is the way of self-reliance, which unwittingly is built on the pride of life and so is one of Satan's more successful tactics and lies, and is why we see it being promoted in our world today, in occult circles, the New Age movement, in business, popular culture, and if it were possible, even from our own pulpits. What's up, Church by the Glades, and happy Hogwarts Halloween! And I look at the whole religious scene today, and all I see are the inventions and ministries of man and flesh. It's mostly powerless. It has no impact on the world. And I see more of the world coming into the church and impacting the church rather than the church impacting the world. I see the music taking over the house of God. I see entertainment taking over the house of God. An obsession with entertainment in God's house. A hatred of correction and a hatred of reproof. Nobody wants to hear it anymore. Comedy, yes. Happy singing, yes. Eating, fellowship, good time, yes. Weeping, anguish, praying, fasting, no, no, no. We'll not have it. Does it matter to you at all that God's spiritual Jerusalem, the church, is now married to the world? Going to churches where they can find smooth messages, no longer wanting to hear anything of wrath or of correction. Little by little, you're losing the love of God, the love of Christ. Little by little, these things are making inroads. These things that creep in, and suddenly this Jerusalem, the walls go down. The sign of ruin that's slowly draining spiritual power and passion. That's all the devil wants to do is get the fight out of you and kill him. Where's the anguish? Where are the tears? Anguish means extreme pain and distress. Acute, deeply felt inner pain because of conditions about you. 
dignity, deep pain. It's all ruined! ruined. This is a huge part of the great end times lie, which robs a man of salvation in Christ. A lying notion and message being the fulfillment of the proverbial wolf in sheep's clothing, a message and gospel which manages to sit easier within our hearts of pride, tempted to see and depend on ourselves as the answer. It hasn't ended there. Now, slowly but surely, we are being fed the ultimate lie that we ourselves are deity and are ourselves gods, able to save ourselves and this world without the need or reliance in God. Or, as evolutionist Richard Luantin puts it, we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. We can see this new faith being expressed not only in popular culture and New Age faith movements, but also in our sciences, which believes it is better positioned than God to redesign and improve Almighty God's own creation. In effect, elevating himself above God and everything that is called God, sitting in the very place where only God should himself be sat, presenting himself as if he were God. All of life, for four billion years, dinosaurs, amoebas, tomatoes, humans, all of life was subject to the laws of natural selection and to the laws of organic biochemistry. But this is now about to change. Science is replacing evolution by natural selection with evolution by intelligent design. Not the intelligent design, of some god above the clouds, but our intelligent design. As such, we have become a generation so self-absorbed as to have elevated our individual selves and needs above human life itself, and subsequently justify our actions in the name of convenience and lifestyle choice, fast becoming a people who have systematically been programmed to accept the faithless mantra of party hard now and to hell with the consequences for tomorrow we die instead of holding fast to the hope of eternal life through faith in God's Son through the gospel who gave himself for our failures and sins that we might always have a hope and are able to repent and always start again in him instead we are choosing rather to be a generation that compromises truth and is ready to accept a lie in exchange for truth. A lie of false peace built on the sinking sands of compromise. A peace which refuses to accept Yeshua, Jesus, God's Son and only given way of salvation toward mankind. This is the generation which God's two witnesses come back to witness to. Although their witness is indeed to expose the truth of a world fallen from grace and to convict us all that we might be humbled and prepared for the second coming of Yeshua, Jesus, in glory, not a suffering servant this time, but as the victorious King of Kings, that on his return some might not be condemned along with the rest of this dying world. Yet, as crucial as this part of their ministry will be, we believe that they carry and deliver a far, far greater witness than this, as there have always been prophets to convict this world of its wrongs. This will be a witness that neither man nor Satan will be able to deny, a witness as great, if not greater, even than that of John the Baptist, or of the Apostle Peter, Paul, or John. How is this possible? A witness, we believe, will be so great 
that even God's own people, the Jews, will not be able nor want to deny Yeshua, Jesus, as their Lord and Saviour, which we believe is the very purpose of that coming witness. But how and what is it? Then please come with us now as we take you back to the first century to a high mountain top within the boundaries of Judea. Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James and John, his brother, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, Lord it is good for, it us, is good to for us to be here. If you wish, you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, tabernacles, one for you, one, one for Moses, Moses and one and for Elijah. Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face, and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them, and said, Arise, and be not afraid. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. There has been much debate and many sermons given regarding the purpose and meaning of this scene of Jesus' transfiguration on the mountain top. Many have suggested that here we are being given a glimpse into future glories of Jesus' millennial reign on earth following the Great Tribulation and Rebellion. And indeed, we do see Jesus, Moses and Elijah gleaming and in glorified state, which might seem to lend support to such a claim. On top of this, we do read how six days earlier, Jesus declared to his disciples, Truly, I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see that the Kingdom of God has come with power. And so, for the duration of that brief encounter, the Kingdom of God truly was present, viewable and discernible to the disciples' perception. You don't need me to tell you that usually, in our current reality, it is hidden from our eyes so that we must live by faith in that which we cannot see, yet believe. So, it was likely not so much a peep into some future glory, but rather a glimpse of the heavenly reality. A reality that one day, those of faith in Christ will enjoy as their only reality, as there is always a kingdom of God, of course. Put another way, the heavenly dimension was opened up for them to experience, so that we, being told of it, might also believe. If this is not the case, then we are left with a couple of problems. If we scoot over and read the account in the Gospel of Luke, we see we are given an extra detail. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. The details within these verses are so useful to us as they eliminate any notion that what is being experienced here is nothing more than a vision of future millennial glory. How so? If this was merely a prophetic reflection of the future, then Moses and Elijah would not be speaking of current issues, i.e. his demise, which he should soon accomplish in Jerusalem. Likewise, we then find the Lord God Almighty speaking directly to the disciples from within the cloud, this instructing them the that they should put son. their trust and yeah. focus on his son only, again proving to us that this was very real and very current. So we are here left with a very puzzling question. Why were these two prophets called to this mountain top? And why were they discussing the Lord's soon coming crucifixion in Jerusalem? Are we to believe that there be no importance in their discourse? 
no relevance to our Lord's plan of salvation here, that they were merely meeting up with the Lord for a quick chit-chat and catch-up, more than a little unlikely. And of course, we are not the only ones to have pondered this. See, I also tend to regard the Transfiguration as a staff meeting. Jesus and these two witnesses are having a discussion, an extended discussion, about the uh, Second Coming. And uh, so we know uh, they've talked about the Second Coming, and that seems to be the illusion of Luke 9.31. Also, 1 Peter 1 and 2 Peter 1, both Peter makes, Peter is really impressed with that. It shows up. He makes allusions to it in his first letter and in his second letter. A staff meeting indeed, yet more than this, rather, a briefing before the main event, for this was not merely to discuss the yet far future second coming of the Lord, for it is clearly recorded that Moses and Elijah appeared in glorified state, yet spoke regarding the Lord's decease, which he should soon accomplish at Jerusalem. Clearly, therefore, the briefing and topic being discussed by the three atop the mountain here was the death and resurrection of our Lord. But why would Moses and Elijah be called to a briefing atop a mountain to discuss a topic for which they had little to do with? What if they did indeed have major roles to play within the Lord's soon coming passion in Jerusalem? And if this be the case, do the scriptures provide support for it? Let's now travel a few short miles away over to Jerusalem and a few short weeks ahead of time from this point on top of the mountain where we read how the women who were devoted to Yeshua had returned to the tomb site to anoint the body with oils and fragrant spices in accordance with the Jews' custom. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? Why do you seek he is not here, among the dead? but is risen. He is not here. He is risen. Wow! Two men arrayed in shining garments, standing outside the Lord's tomb during the time of his resurrection from the dead. Two men whose descriptions bear striking resemblance to both Moses and Elijah's atop the Mount of Transfiguration, which we just read. In both cases, these men were described as being in glorified state. Little wonder then, that in other Gospel accounts, these two men at the tomb of our Lord were described as being angelic messengers. Yet here, in this account, the correct identification was made and are instead accurately described as two men in shining garments. Fear not ye, for we know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. In fact, in reverse, it's not at all uncommon for angels to be described as men within scripture. So not overly unusual if here, these gleaming men are described as being angelic. And so, as you might expect, we ask the Lord to show us if there might be any other accounts of two glorified men involved in the Lord Jesus' salvation work. And immediately, the Holy Spirit took our minds straightways to the account of the Ascension in the Book of Acts. Let's go take a look. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? 
And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times nor the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, Men of Galilee why do you stand gazing up you into stand heaven? Up the into same heaven. Jesus who was the taken up from Jesus you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. My goodness, here once again, Two men in gleaming white, present at the ascension of Christ into heaven, just as there had also been at the Lord's resurrection from the dead. All this but a short time after both Moses and Elijah had appeared in similar glorified state atop the mount, discussing our Lord's decease, which he should soon accomplish at Jerusalem. Could it be that these two men namely Moses and Elijah, who had discussed the death and resurrection with our Lord atop the mount, are the same two present at each vital milestone of the Lord's salvation work on our behalf. It seems more than plausible, and increasingly so when we begin to prayerfully ponder the scriptures concerning the two witnesses of the book of Revelation, as well as other texts within biblical canon. It's likely clear by now that, yes, we believe Moses and Elijah to be those two witnesses spoken of in John's revelation. Yet we are aware and appreciate that other folks believe differently. But no matter your persuasion, we ask that you continue with us a while longer while we investigate further. Yet, more importantly, by no means is the identity of these two men the main focus or point being made here in scripture, but rather the purpose of their mission and witness must surely be what is in focus. With this in mind, neither is the focus and purpose of this film rested on their identity, as important as this turns out to be, but rather on the purpose of their witness. So, it is our hope that you, as we were, are equally blessed when you see how God has opened up this mystery in these closing days, as, if nothing else, this mystery revealed declares just how faithful, long-suffering and merciful Almighty God truly is. should you choose to accept it. Just as stated, the identity of these two men is of lesser priority when compared with the importance of understanding their witness and mission. Yet, at the same time, once we understand who these two are, it turns out that only they could accurately match the photo fit that scripture puts together for us. Once we recognize this, then things begin to fall into place as to why it could only ever be these two who would or could satisfy the prophetic expectations given in scripture and accomplish the main mission parameters given to them by the Lord. This message will self-destruct in five seconds.
Let's take a brief look at a few signposts given us within scripture. Signposts which come in the form of types, shadows and similitudes, which lead us to understand not only who these two are, but also what we can expect from them when they come and why. It would be useful at this stage if you were to pause this film and read the book of Exodus again, as we can't afford the time within this film to read the whole account. Yet, to briefly recap, Moses was the child of Hebrew Jewish slaves held captive by Pharaoh in Egypt, but who by divine protection and prophetic providence had been raised as a prince in Egypt. Yet, after seeing an Egyptian taskmaster badly mistreat one of his own Hebrew brethren and countrymen, Moses smote the Egyptian taskmaster and then quickly fled Egypt as Pharaoh wanted his life in reparation. Moses was away from Egypt for 40 years, in which time he dwelt in Midian, with a Midian priest and his daughters, one of which he married. Here in the Midian wilderness stood the mountain of the living God. The Almighty spoke with Moses from the burning bush, instructing and sending him back to Egypt to confront Pharaoh to let his people, the Hebrew slaves, go. Moses was to return to Egypt with his Levite Hebrew brother, Aaron, who was already en route to visit Moses at Midian. These two would be witnesses for God, not only to Pharaoh, but also to his Jewish brethren captive in Egypt, who had been praying for the Deliverer to come. The Lord of hosts will do battle for us. Behold his mighty hand. This was to be the backdrop which saw the standoff of all standoffs between Pharaoh, Moses and Aaron on behalf of Almighty God, for which, of course, there would only ever be one winner. Here we read of very real events, which eventually saw the Jewish people miraculously delivered from their taskmaster's hand in Egypt. But not before God had used these two witnesses, Moses and Aaron, to bring down certain plagues on Pharaoh in Egypt. Water turned to blood, a plague of frogs, swarms of biting insects leading to pestilence, great boils and sores, and great hail fell from the sky, swarms of locusts destroying all of their crops, and a great and terrible tangible darkness swept over the whole land of Egypt. Still the enemy's heart was hardened, so that the only ones to escape God's final judgment were those who put their trust on the blood of the lamb which was to be applied to the doorpost and lintel until finally the judgment of God struck Egypt fiercely and the firstborn from every Egyptian family including Pharaoh's was slain these were the plagues that were poured out on a rebellious Egypt plagues which we clearly see replayed and revisited in the book of Revelation by the two witnesses which we have to do. The correlations between Exodus and Revelation are clear, with parallel scriptures and events such as water turning to blood, fishes and sea life dying because of putrefying waters, Demons coming out of the abyss like swarms of locusts. Loathsome sores infecting only those who rejected Christ and instead received the mark of the beast. Great hailstones falling from heaven, each one weighing over a hundred pounds. A great and terrifying darkness that covers the whole face of the earth and leaving the sun as if covered by sackcloth and the moon as if drenched in blood. This by no means being an exhaustive account of the parallels or types given between Exodus and Revelation. Yet, 
enough to understand that the events witnessed in Egypt are to once again be played out, only this time on a massive global scale. Therefore, all of the events witnessed in the Exodus are also to be viewed and understood as signs, warnings and instructions for those living in that last generation who belong to or turn to Jesus Christ at that time. Yet also, it cannot be missed how these two witnesses have the power to shut the heavens so that no rain falls during the days of their prophesying, exactly how Elijah did when dealing with King Ahab, Jezebel and the prophets of Baal or Baal in Israel. But what of Elijah? It is interesting to note that the Jews are expecting Elijah to return before Messiah come. So much so that to this day they set an extra place, pour a glass of wine and leave a chair out for him during Passover. Indeed, the return of Elijah is very much a requirement. Now as they came down from the Mount of Transfiguration, he, Jesus, commanded Peter, James and John that they should tell no one the things they had seen till the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept this word to themselves, questioning what the rising from the dead meant. And they asked him, saying, Why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Then he answered and told them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and restores all things. And how is it written concerning the Son of Man? That he must suffer many things and be treated with contempt. But I say to you that Elijah has also come and they did to him whatever they wished, as it is written of him. Then the disciples understood that he was talking to them about John the Baptist. Many believers have taken Jesus' words to mean that the Old Testament prophecies concerning Elijah's return just before the coming of the Lord were completely fulfilled by John the Baptist. However, Jesus here does not imply such a thing, as clearly when he says, indeed, Elijah is coming first and restores all things. He speaks of another day, still yet to come. Please remember that at this moment in time, the world, nor even his closest apostles, understood anything of the great mystery or victory of the yet future cross, nor anything of the subsequent need for two great appearings of our Lord. Once for the saving and rescue of the whole of mankind through faith in the one who Almighty God himself had testified should die for their sins. And again, a second time, yet future, for the judging of the enemies of God, and more importantly, the restoration of the Jews and Israel to a pure and holy faith and kingdom under their Messiah. Here, our Lord is answering and explaining these great mysteries, yet hard to understand until after the cross. So what really had they asked him here? Well, they understood that, before Messiah should come, prophetically speaking, there remained a requirement that Elijah should come first. Therefore, if Jesus was indeed the arrival of the promised Messiah, then what had happened to Elijah's ministry of restoration beforehand? And if the coming of Messiah was to be the ushering in of God's kingdom on earth, then what was all this talk of suffering, death and resurrection? You can understand their confusion without the luxury of their soon to be acquired hindsight after the resurrection. It appeared to them that indeed there were discrepancies discrepancies clearly causing them discomfort, which could potentially have held them back from a complete trusting faith in Jesus as their promised Messiah. So, 
just as there were to be two visitations from our Lord, likewise there need be two similar ministries of restoration and renewal, one for each great appearing of the Lord. A great mystery is being revealed for the first time here, both to us and to his apostles, a mystery of two comings, both of Messiah and of his prophet, who would prepare the way for him in both great appearings, both sharing virtually identical ministries and purposes, and both being anointed with the same mantle of the Holy Spirit, yet without doubt being distinct from one another, both in the day of their witness as well as in their identity. If we jump back to the account of John the Baptist's revealing of Yeshua, Jesus, as the Son of God in the Gospels, we hear him openly proclaim to the scribes and the Pharisees who had asked who he was and under what authority he washes away sins in baptism. He confessed and did not deny, but confessed and said, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Clearly, John here understood that he was indeed a major part of the fulfillment of Isaiah 40 verse 3. Yet, at the same time, fully understood that, as we have just heard from his own lips, he was not Elijah. Therefore, the literal Elijah must indeed return and restore all things, just as Jesus made clear here as they descended the mountain. And just maybe, this is why these things were revealed to the apostles as they descended from the Mount of Transfiguration. As, in a certain sense, if the Jewish nation had trusted and believed on Yeshua after the Lord's resurrection, then indeed, maybe, there needn't have been another day or a second coming and visitation, as Messiah would have been fully received by all his brethren and the good news would have gone out to a world ripe for hope. Through and administered by them, the Jewish people, the natural olive branch. Yet sadly, because of his people's unbelief, the gospel was given over to the Gentiles to administer, and the day of their own restoration would now need wait and be put on hold. Yet, after almost 2,000 years, from a wilderness of their own making, after being scattered abroad across the Gentile nations for their sins, yet now, having paid double for those sins, finally, God has brought them home to their land, ready for these great events to once again unfold and take place, and for their blindness to be removed, for the sake not only of Messiah, their brother, but also to fulfill the promises given to the patriarchal Jewish fathers. Because when we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. In spite of all these clear signs, shadows, types and similitudes we've looked at, some still cast doubt over the legitimacy of Moses being a clear candidate for one of the two witnesses here in Revelation 11. Curiously, however, relatively few disagree that Elijah is likely one of the two, due to reasons already discussed. The reality here is somewhat different, in that more of the miracles we see done by these two witnesses in Revelation mirror those done by Moses during his life and ministry. So why is this? How can this be? Why such a rejection by some regarding the notion of Moses being our other witness? Embroidered within our modern Christian theology, as well as in many Jewish minds today, is the belief that Elijah never physically died, that he was taken up 
into heaven without ever tasting death. Many have concluded that this makes good logical sense as to how it is possible for Elijah to be able to return to us in the future. Couple this with the scripture in Hebrews 9 which reads, It is appointed unto men to die once, but after this the judgment. And we have our embroidered and seemingly settled by many modern theology. On this single scripture, many have rejected Moses out of hand, and instead another candidate has been searched for, who also maybe did not taste death. In searching the scriptures, a seemingly valid possibility has been discovered in Genesis 5, where a few short obscure words are written regarding Enoch. Genesis 5 and 24 reads, And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. This line of text is indeed peculiar. It may well be that Enoch was indeed taken up into heaven without dying. Yet, no matter which interpretation turns out to be correct, or whichever side of this fence we sit, there is still no way to biblically support the notion that someone cannot come back from the dead if the Lord so wills it to be so. Remember that within the biblical record itself, we have many events recorded which prove otherwise. Take for example, in 1 Kings, when Elijah brings the widow's son back to life. The Shunammite woman's son brought back to life in 2 Kings. We also have Jairus' daughter in the Gospel of Luke chapter 8. Lazarus likewise was raised back to life from the dead by our Lord in John 11. Also Tabitha and Ichicus in the book of Acts. And of course our Lord himself as well as the saints who were raised and seen in the city after Jesus' resurrection, and many other besides, all of whom had died in the flesh, yet returned and lived again. So you see, the argument that a man cannot ever return from the dead cannot be substantiated by a single misinterpreted scripture in Hebrews, which most agree was actually dealing with an early pagan form of the belief in a reincarnation and not that of resurrection from the dead at all. Besides, we should never build a doctrine on any single scripture. Remember, the law of needing at least two witnesses applies within the interpreting of scripture too. Therefore, Moses need not, and indeed should not, be disqualified from being the candidate clearly in focus here in John's Revelation. Furthermore, it is worth noting here also that Enoch lived in the old world prior to the flood and obviously was not a Jew, which is key to unraveling and understanding this very Jewish-centered mystery. Furthermore, it is interesting to recognize that there have only ever been two men who talked with God face to face on Mount Horeb, which is Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. The first being Moses, when acquiring the law, and the second being Elijah, who was sent to the mountain of God by the angel after fleeing Jezebel. Both had very similar experiences too, as both fasted 40 days in relation to their time facing God on the mountain. Let's see. So he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He neither ate bread nor drank water, and he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Exodus 34, 28. And now Elijah. And as he, Elijah, lay and slept under the juniper tree, behold, an angel touched him, and said unto him, Arise, and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baked on the coals, and a jar of water at his head. And he did eat and drink, and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time, and touched him, and said, Arise, and eat, because the journey is too great for you. And he arose, and did eat and drink, and went in the strength of that food for forty days and forty nights, until Horeb, the mountain of God. 1 Kings 19, verses 5-8 through 8. Therefore clearly, after the angel of the Lord had both fed and watered Elijah, 
then sent him on his way to meet the Lord on the mountain of Zad, he ate and drank no more for 40 days, just as Moses ate and drank nothing for 40 days, while he too was with the Lord on the same mountain of God. In fact, as far as I am aware, the only other living person to fast 40 days without food or water in the wilderness was Jesus himself. And it is indeed curious that it is these three who we see together atop the mountain, discussing what the Lord himself will soon accomplish for the world in Jerusalem, namely his sacrificial death on the cross and his soon to follow resurrection. It's also worth noting that, generally speaking, the only biblical characters whose lives were typified by many miracles in the Tanakh or Old Testament were Moses, Elijah and Elisha, with Elisha really being a continuation of Elijah's ministry anyway. Yet, regarding the events surrounding the two witnesses to come in the Revelation, we are given yet another hint from God himself as to how the world will view these two men when they come, which will be in much the same way as Pharaoh and the magicians saw Moses and Aaron in the Exodus when God himself proclaimed. So the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you as God to Pharaoh, and Aaron your brother shall be your prophet. Exodus 7 and 1 even here, I believe we see a picture and type of the two witnesses to come, the lawgiver and the prophet, the two which the children of Israel will once again follow and who will once more face the enemy of God in the standoff of all standoffs, not Pharaoh and his magicians this time, but rather Antichrist and the kings and sorcerers of his short-lived satanic coalition which has taken Satan an age to erect by use of many a power-greedy elitist-minded stooge yet will last but a short time when the Son of God, Yeshua, Jesus, the stone cut out without hands, returns shortly to put all of God's enemies underfoot. For this final rebellious empire will be every bit as stiff-necked as Pharaoh was and more and so will present in the same way as it did then. Were not the Egyptian magicians, leaders and people in living dread of both Moses and Aaron? Very much so, yes. So that, eventually, even the magicians could in no way use their enchantments to simulate the power of God and so were forced to give glory to God as it is written. Now the magicians worked with their enchantments to bring forth lice, but they could not. So there were lice on man and beast. Then the magician said to Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. Again it is written of them. Then Pharaoh's servant said to him, How long shall this man be a snare to us? Let the men go, that they may serve the Lord their God. Do you not yet know that Egypt is destroyed? Oh, how this language casts future reflections on our two witnesses of the fast approaching last days, where we read that after these two witnesses have poured out plagues upon the whole earth. Reports are still pouring in from around the world of cataclysmic events allegedly predicted and caused by these two radical Jewish prophets. They are finally killed in Jerusalem. We are then told how the peoples of the earth will be so relieved at this news that they will send gifts to one another in celebration and relief at their murder. Revelation 11, 7 through 10. Unprecedented seats of jubilation have erupted worldwide. At the report of the killing of the two Jewish prophets right before the dedication of the third Jewish temple in Jerusalem. And just as it was in Egypt with Moses and Aaron, these two witnesses will stand against Satan, Antichrist, and the satanic world order they have erected. And again will cry out with a loud voice, 
Let my people go, so that the curse, which threw unbelief and rejection in Yeshua, and which has held them blind for almost 2,000 years, may be lifted, so that they may once again be grafted back into their natural olive vine. For God has not finished with his people, which he foreknew. Let's go and see. Now, after three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet. And great fear fell on those who saw them, and they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. These two men, who the Lord purposefully describes as his two witnesses, after being resurrected from the dead and ascending to heaven in the sight of the whole world, will, through the word of their witness and miracle of resurrection, set in motion a sequence of prophetic events which will ultimately restore the descendants of Israel back to a pure and living faith in the God of their fathers through the receiving at last of Yeshua, Jesus, as their Messiah and kinsman redeemer. Sounds unlikely? Well, many over the centuries would agree, as over the last 2,000 years of Gentile church history, those in various denominations who have embraced the doctrine of replacement theology have always tried to substitute itself in place of Israel and has vehemently opposed any notion that God might not yet have finished with his people Israel. This mindset is responsible for a major share of the blame regarding the persecution poured out on the Jews throughout their sojourn across the nations over the centuries before returning back home again by the miracle and providence of God to their homeland in this, our generation. Those who believe such, either subliminally, but more often purposefully, promote the notion that God has forever divorced himself from his people who he formerly knew and has replaced them with the church. In no way is this scriptural and has always at its root been used as an attempt by some to supplant God's promises meant for Israel. Remember that God's original and first plan for Israel was that they would receive the good news after Yeshua's resurrection, believe on him and be saved. That salvation was intended for the Jew first and also for the Gentile just as the Apostle Peter also goes on to express. The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing will come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom you have crucified, whom the heaven must receive until a time of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said unto our fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall you hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. Take him. Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. But unto you first, God having raised up his son Jesus, 
sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. Then it was to be they, his people, who were to go out into the world as his ministers and vessel by which the world would be saved. As the Apostle Paul confessed it, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Romans 1 verse 16 But as we know, both throughout history and the present day, the majority of the Jewish people have sadly rejected Yeshua as their Messiah blinded to God's righteousness through unbelief. But not all, as during that whole time there have always been a remnant of believing Jews scattered across the face of the earth, as Paul once again expresses. I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin, God has not cast away his people, whom he foreknew. Nevertheless, national Israel did fall until this day. The destruction of the temple in the year 70 was the greatest catastrophe and trauma to happen to Jewish people, I would argue, until our own time in the Holocaust. It was the center of the economic life of the Jewish people, as if the Federal Reserve was housed in the temple. It was the center of the judicial law. The Supreme Court was housed in the temple. It was the center of the religious life, as if the high priest was the chief rabbi, centered in that building. And in a matter of hours, it was gone. And although Israel has indeed been brought back to their land by the Lord, there remains yet a spiritual restoration to come for Israel, as Israel fell at the stumbling stone, the rock of offence, which is Christ our Lord, the chief cornerstone. But how and by what means did they fall? Through unbelief. And the Gentiles now stand in the grace of God, how? Through believing in Christ, through faith. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Is it possible that national Israel and all her people will one day soon believe in Yeshua unto salvation? And does scripture suggest such a thing? Indeed, yes, it does in many ways and in many places. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Romans 11, 29. The hand of the Lord was upon me. He brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, O sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the voice of the Lord. I will make breath into you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise, a rattling sound. And the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked and tendons and flesh appeared on them and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath and say to it, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me and breath entered them. 
they came to life and stood up on their feet. A vast army. This vision, given to Ezekiel by the Lord, of a valley filled with dry dead bones, is an open window into the future for the prophet to peer through. It shows national Israel thousands of years ahead from his standpoint in history, which, even more amazingly, seems to be pouring light on the Israel we now see coming into focus in this our era. The dry bones being knit back together and being given flesh once more are those of Israel as we see her today. A nation and people reunited back with their homeland who until recently were considered dead and buried by the nations of this world never to be resurrected again. Yet can Almighty God's words fail? Didn't he swear and foretell how he would call his people back out from among those nations where he had dispersed them for their sins? Indeed, yes, he did. So, against unspeakable odds, and after many centuries of rejection, hatred and abuse, often from those nations where they had sought refuge, we witness a mighty miracle the sustaining and regathering of Israel by the mighty hand of Almighty God. A nation reborn after 2,000 years, thriving in both commerce and culture. The fig tree putting forth bud and blossom. We will move the American Embassy to the eternal capital of the Jewish people, Jerusalem. Over a century ago, the Balfour Declaration recognized the right of the Jewish people to a national home in this land. And exactly 70 years ago today, President Truman became the first world leader to recognize the newborn Jewish state. Last December, President Trump became the first world leader to recognize Jerusalem as our capital. And today, the United States of America is opening its embassy right here in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, 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 Jerusalem. Flesh on the bones. Yet, while Israel continues to reject God's righteousness, which is through faith in Yeshua, her Messiah, there can never truly be any breath of eternal life in her. For salvation does not come through works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saves us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit whom he pours out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Saviour. Israel must first receive Yeshua, their Messiah and kinsman Redeemer, before they will truly be born again as a righteous nation under God. Therefore, this resurrected body of flesh still awaits the breath of life, which only the Spirit of God can give through Yeshua, their brother and king, before it is truly and eternally saved. And in a similar and prophetic way, didn't Joseph's brothers reject Joseph and cast him into a pit, then sold him as a slave to the nations? And wasn't it they who refused to acknowledge their sin to their father, Jacob? then continued to live out their lie and crime before their father's face for many years. Yet, God raised Joseph up over Egypt, not only to save and feed the famine-starved souls of the Gentile nations thereabout, but ultimately to forgive and to restore his brethren, to save and to bless them. But not before they acknowledged their great sin, and offence towards Joseph and toward their father. Indeed, Israel could only be saved in this way, by the repentance of their souls and the receiving of their brother as their king, as was likewise prophesied by the prophet Hosea, speaking of Messiah, when he was inspired to write, I will return again to my place 
until they acknowledge their offense. Then they will seek my face. In their affliction, they will earnestly seek me. Hosea 5 and 15. Just as Yeshua fulfilled the first part of this by proclaiming to the Jews, you shall see me no more, till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Matthew 23, 39. Yet, the big question here has to be, what will it take to open the blinded eyes of this nation, Israel, and to cause them to confess their offense before Almighty God? A nation and people who refuse to receive the witness of Messiah's 12 apostles, their own countrymen, who had literally seen the Lord arisen and alive over many days after his resurrection. What greater witness could possibly be offered a Jewish people alive today that might change their minds, if this first-hand, first-century witness and account had already proven to be not enough for them? Or just maybe we are asking the wrong questions. What if the right questions are, what is the one crucial element not claimed as being witness within the gospel record? Something that neither Jew, Roman soldier, disciple, nor apostle had laid claim to having witnessed during those events concerning Yeshua in the first century AD. And maybe another question to ask, whose witness might today's Jews sit up and take notice of? over that of the first century Jewish apostles themselves, to change the hearts and minds of this current generation of Jews, steeped in anti-Yeshua tradition, it would truly need to be an even greater witness, both in detail and authority. Is there such a witness? Well, we believe so. Moses and Elijah, called to meet with Yeshua, our Lord, on the Mount of Transfiguration. And why are these two characters in John's Revelation introduced to us as his two witnesses? Not his two apostles, nor his two prophets, nor messengers, but specifically his two witnesses. Is this merely a flippant throwaway title or detail? Or is the Lord giving us a major clue to something more profound and foundational in our understanding of who these two men are and what it is they bear witness to? And who are the two anointed ones mentioned earlier in Zechariah chapter 4, which we promised to get back to? These two olive trees and two olive branches which drip the golden oil into the receptacles represent both the law and the prophets. Yet, more specifically, although the books of the law and the prophets have always been a witness to the world, in these last days both the law and the prophets are to be embodied in human form and for very good reason and to help us in these last days to understand what is about to take place we believe that God has opened up a very important detail within the text in Zechariah 4 where the text reads these are the two anointed ones who stand beside the Lord of the whole earth. Where, in our study, have we seen both Moses and Elijah together stood either side of the Lord of the whole earth? Of course, on the Mount of Transfiguration. Yet more than this, 
much more. For the purpose of that meeting atop the mount was merely a last minute preparation between our Lord Yeshua and these two prophets, as well as for the apostles also present, to make record of this event for our sakes, or how else could we today connect the dots? We believe that those two prophets in gleaming white atop the mount with our Lord were the same two men in gleaming garment seen at the Lord's resurrection who confessed, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day rise again. No man ever laid claim to have witnessed the literal rising of the Lord back from the dead. The apostles had seen him alive after the event, as had a great many others, as the Apostle Paul describes for us. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas Peter, then by the twelve. After that he was seen by over five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that he was seen by James, then by all the apostles, then last of all he was seen by me also as by one born out of due time. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 through 8 No soul ever proclaimed to have witnessed the very breath enter our Lord's body at the point of his resurrection. Yet, oh my goodness, of course someone did. In fact, two men did, because this is exactly what is legally required by Almighty God if testimony and witness is to be put forward in any legal case or claim. God has indeed prepared his witnesses of this most crucial moment and event in human history. And could there be two more credible witnesses which the Lord God Almighty could have chosen? Two men who literally and truly represent God's legal requirements and prophetic fulfillment. And this, of course, would have been more than enough. Yet, it does not stop there, for the Lord continues to seal up his case with these two witnesses. For as we have already seen, these same two men in gleaming garment are again present at our Lord's ascension into heaven when they spoke to the astounded apostles as the Lord ascended, saying to them, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Acts 1 verse 11 But why go to all this trouble? Well, first of all, as we have discussed already, it is required that there be at least two witnesses in any legal case within God's law. But also, these two men, Moses and Elijah, we read, will be required to stand and witness these events, first of all, to none other than Antichrist, the great usurper and enemy of truth, who is set to arise any time soon onto the world stage. In fact, in Revelation 11, we read a text which sounds remarkably similar 
in context to that we read in Zechariah chapter 4 concerning these same two anointed witnesses where it reads and I will give power to my two witnesses these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth yet although these two here are indeed the same two anointed ones proclaiming what they had witnessed at the Lord's resurrection and ascension here they are not stood either side of the Lord of the whole earth who is Jesus Yeshua but rather are stood before or in front of the God of the earth bearing witness of the things they had seen against him and standing off against him who are we told is currently the God of this world who is it men knowingly or unknowingly worship if they reject the witness of the gospel yes Satan and here at the end of times he hoping to both imitate Yeshua and deceive those who dwell on the earth has taken a human body for himself this is not Yeshua but Antichrist in a delusion that if it were possible could even deceive the very elect and maybe could if it were not for these two anointed witnesses who witness the greatest event in human history yet amazingly even all of this is not all that these two witnesses will accomplish for God fulfills his promises given to the patriarchal fathers of the Jewish people and causes to come to pass that which the Apostle Paul proclaimed when he boldly said all Israel will be saved yet what will it take to bring Israel into faith of their Messiah and Israel who for 2,000 years have rejected and denied the witness of their own countrymen the Apostles who had seen the Lord Yeshua alive from the dead indeed the text even seems to go on to suggest that even after Moses and Elijah have delivered their witness to the Jewish nation it will still take the very death resurrection and ascension of these two holy prophets Moses and Elijah to validate their claim of having witnessed the very breath of life enter the lungs of our Lord and have seen him ascend into heaven on high then will the nation's blindness finally be lifted and thus the prophecy will finally come to pass and I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication then they will look upon me whom they pierced yes they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn indeed all Israel will be saved and the Lord Jesus Yeshua will be exalted in that day for he is the Savior of the world to all who believe for not by works of righteousness which we have done but according to his mercy he saves us if you have not trusted in Yeshua yet for the washing away of your blame and sin the offer from the Lord remains but be warned time is running out for the Lord is and has been so very long-suffering and gracious from generation to generation however he has also sworn that his spirit will not strive with men forever so please act now before that time comes as currently whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved God bless each of you and thank you all so much for sharing in this journey with us Amen and Amen Come Lord Jesus
come.